we're going to be talking today about uh, group heads. And specifically, this is a question that I see popping up all the time. I see actually not just the question popping up, huge amount of confusion over, mm -hmm. this, over this area. And I don't, don't know an awful lot about it. So I'm actually going to play the dumb person who's asking the questions. Uh, because I am the dumb person asking I'm the questions. I'm going to play the dumb person answering the question. <laughs> so I we're the perfect, to... yeah, it's the dumb and dumber show, ladies and gentlemen. Um, trademark does not apply. And, uh, and so this is the, the question is about group heads and whether the saturated group heads are better than the E61. And you say, ah, oh, yeah, you know, it's better. What? Okay, but I want to really understand is, what I want to understand is a few things. First of all, I want to understand what better even means. And generally people are talking about temperature stability. Mm -hmm. But then there's temperature stability for one shot or for multiple shots. So we've got to take that into the right context. Then there's the question of whether you're running an E61 group head on a heat exchanger machine or a dual boiler, or I guess a single boiler machine. And we kind of want to take that out of the equation because we want to be looking at group heads here, not the issues brought into the equation by you know other technologies, heat exchanger, et cetera. So I think... Tell me if I'm wrong here. If we just want to look at efficient group heads and like where, you know, one may be, um, may be more predictable, better than the other, we should be looking at the E61 group heads on either a dual boiler or a single boiler machine versus a saturated group head. Is that, was that a fair assessment? Yes. Because we haven't talked about this. So I'm kind of, we're, we're flying by the seat of our pants a little bit here. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Um, hmm. So that's what I want to look at, really. And the question people always go, and you hear people talking about temperature stability on E61s and running cooling flushes, and all sorts of people get very mm -hmm. excited about it. it's a three-second cooling flush, it's a six-second cooling flush. Do you even need to do a cooling flush? And then other people come along and say, whoa, 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 Tiger. There's been changes in the way you know, the, the manufacturers make those um, machines with the E61 group heads, and now temperature stability isn't an issue. And really, we just want to try and clear up this confusion. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you why, in particular, I want to clear up this confusion is because machines with saturated group heads, not exclusively, but generally mm -hmm. more expensive, the ones that I'm yep. looking at. So well, that's, I think that's just, a, I mean, of construction, but mm. so let's, let's start with, uh, with, with two things. First of all, what is a, what's the difference? What's a saturated group head and what is uh, an E61? So the E61 is, I think anyone that follows this channel knows it by now, because come on, you, you coffee We talk notes. about it, right? We talk about it. And also it's the one that you always see is the big shiny lump of metal that is, that is uh, um, stuck in front of the shiny box of metal that is a prosumer <laughs> coffee machine. It was developed by Faema in 1961. And it's pretty much hasn't been changed ever since. What it is, it's a radiator. You can call it thermosiphon, but it is a radiator. So you have a hot water going in, cold water coming out, and the thermosiphoning of the water that comes in from the boiler circulates into it. And that's what heats up. I'm slapping my microphone already. And that's what uh, heats up the machine, what, what heats up the group head. Um, so that's the, that's the thing mainly. I mean, I haven't known how to been explained as a radiator before, and that kind of makes a lot of sense because it's a radiator at the end of the day, that, that's what it is. And so a lot of people get confused with the words thermosiphon. So let's just break down the technology Barney style and a thermosiphon simply as I understand it, so I looked into this and I thought, wow, this is going to be complicated. I better, you know, put my glasses on and get very intellectual, but mm -hmm. actually it's just, it's just whatever the word is, convection or whatever, basically means hot water. Uh, although the, I do have a very intelligent question. Hot water yes, taken up. off the top of the boiler, typically that's where the, you know, the heat rises. So you've got pressure building up. Hot water comes to the top of the boiler. It just, with the pressure, I guess, inside the boiler, the hot water goes out through a tube and into the, we call it the mushroom, the, the, the top part of the yes. E61. It goes um, there system yeah cools down goes down and then as it goes down through the it cools yes and then as it cools it 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 then falls it, down to the rest and it goes into the bottom of the boiler where yes. it then thing but here's my intelligent question max mm -hmm. how does how does how if there's unless there's 
because there's no pump running, right? No. So if you imagine you've got the the energy of the hot water, yeah, and the pressure pushing the water. I don't know if it's if it's just heat or or pressure. It's but uh, just the heat that is not just the heat. It's not pushed. It's, it's actually, not pushed. It's because it's it's hot, so it's hotter. Uh, hotter substances are wider, are bigger, mm -hmm. so it's buoyant. So it's lighter because the same amount of water occupies a bigger space than the, than uh, a colder same amount yeah so that so always creates pressure though, doesn't of, it huh? that creates pressure doesn't it no it's not about the pressure it's oh, about okay. buoyancy if you take um but look, I... let's not go down a rat hole because yes. otherwise we'll, we'll go down a rat yeah, exactly. hole so but but hot the, the hot water rises. goes in the top. So it just yes. goes in because it's hot and it's less buoyant and it's more buoyant yeah. and it goes into the top. Then it's cooler. So it gets heavier or whatever, or more dense and it goes down through the bottom. Yeah. What, how does it get back into the bottom of the boiler? Because it's colder. Yeah. But the bottom of, oh, it's bottom, colder than the water in the boiler. Yes. And so that, and because it's colder, it's more dense. It can get into the bottom. It gets into the bottom and also the, the hot water on top will push it. Push oh, because there's like that so suctiony thing, which the molecules drag other and, molecules. And the water that... level in the boiler is above the pipes for both of these. Uh -huh. Plus, when you fill up the machine, when you have the refill, the refill water goes in, goes through the pipe, so the pipe is always full. In fact, one of the problems of the E61 machines is you can have an airlock. Yeah, I heard about you that. It's quite rare, though. And less rare than you think. You can have an yeah. air bubble going in into the um, into the piping and then it gets stuck on the top of the mushroom that's and right it can actually block the whole thing it doesn't work anymore but you just need to release it it's like bleeding a radiator for those you of us in england the radiator precisely that yeah yeah um so anyway so basically that's the e61 is this yes. is this mechanism from 1961 which was it actually i realized then and i'm, I'm so glad you pronounced it fema because i wasn't really sure is it fa faima <laughs> faima fa faima Mm -hmm. Because I was never sure how to pronounce it, but but the, yeah, they invented it in 1961, which I was guessing why it's called the E61. Yes, because um, that would have been a huge coincidence. And <laughs> from then to today, that I mean, there are slight differences. Yeah, I have seen slight different uh, models, but it's the it's same been, same system, right? The outside hasn't changed at all. The insides have been changed and been tweaked, so you have mm -hmm. different different um, different thicknesses, different. Um, um, sizes of the pipes going in but the, the mechanism is the same right and it's i mean it's a huge lump of brass that you heat up and that acts as a thermal mass right you heat it up by thermosiphoning so it's a slow process mm -hmm. and that will absorb the, the heat from the boiler and then that is what your thermal mass is is detached in a way it's detached from the uh, from the from the boiler itself yeah because there's a pipe there's a mechanism there is a, a pipe and... between the boiler and the exactly. which is a so great the... segue into explaining what a saturated exactly. so the, in that case your thermostability is given by the mass of the group head so you heat up the group head and use that residual heat to heat up the rest of of the coffee leave alone that you have a heat exchanger beforehand that that works for all of the machines you have preheated water going into it, but your main thermal stability depends on the on the temperature of the group head. So if you pour, if if you do, if you pull shots, your group head is going to get cold, and then you have to reheat it from the boiler, but by thermosiphoning. Gotcha. So you you get more loss because it's a slower um, heat replenishing if you put it if you want to put it that way. If you have a saturated group head instead, you have the same water that's in the boiler that's actually moved into the group head. So that is your thermal mass. Yeah, the saturated head, as, I, as I've read it, and, I, and I've had one, um, mm -hmm. is basically the boiler. Well, you've had attached. one as what? Well, I, I wasn't going to say, but it's because you know, I know you're going to put me down on it, but like the Gazia Classic Pro is a very, very similar. It's, it's, it's a it's, similar concept. It's a very similar concept where the boiler sits right above yeah. the, 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 the group head. So the group head is just where the water comes out. Yes, basically, it's into technically your, into your it's a saturated filter. group head, but the difference with the Gazia is that you use the, the, you heat up the boiler 
that heats up the water and everything heats up also the group head. So it's similar. It's a little different, but the, the little concept's different. the same. And use the same, the same water. So the same water that get, get, gets heated up goes into your brew. Right. While in a saturated group head like the GS3, the, the, the heated water doesn't get into the coffee. You don't brew with the boiler water. I didn't know that. Is that right? Yeah, you still have separated flows like you have in an E61. So the water that goes into your brew does, is not the same water that is in the, in the boiler, because otherwise you would have, after a while, if you pulled many cappuccinos, you would have a lot of salts, a lot of ions in your water. It's going to be an extremely hard water. Is that the same as uh, the Linear Mini? It should be, yes. Mm. Okay. That's but I don't know, actually, the Linear Mini, the linear mini what, what, what it has. It has a saturated group head. It has a saturated group head. Yeah. So then it's the same as the, the GS3, really. So it's right. the same system. But yes, your boiler water is never used for brewing because it, over time you will accumulate uh, lime scale in it. So you will, it will be an extremely hard of water. So, what, of so sorry, what, what water is used? I'm confused because I thought you had dual you, you boilers. I thought the water. water yeah. No, no, you take cold water, it goes through the heat exchanger. So it goes through a pipe that goes inside the, the, the boiler, but it's separated from I the rest. You. So you have your water in the boiler that's hot, pipe goes in, in copper. The water that goes through the pipe gets heated up while it goes through the pipe. So it gets preheated and then it moves into the brew head. And from the brew head, it gets heated up in the brew head. Now, the, the the saturated group heads, the pipe goes all the way to the group to the group head through inside the um, the boiler, mm -hmm. so it's much hotter. So it can tend to uh, overshoot the temperature. While uh, an E sixty one, it's more prone to undershoot the temperature. So your your water might be colder than your group head. Now, my understanding, Max, is on this, we're getting to the, the crux of it. My understanding is that they have made improvements on this. So you think, well, how do you work it out? Is it all just, you know, but actually, so, uh, hold on uh, a second, but, but before you go, let me just say, let me just say that, that, um, that when I was looking at this, I thought, well, this is, this is really got to be difficult to, to, to be able to determine, predetermine the, the, the temperature, but actually, literally using just this physics i mean if you look at some of the old heat exchanger systems mm -hmm. the they would just work out the type of materials the conductivity of the materials the length that it was traveling and they could very accurately determine um the uh the the temperature from when it left the boiler to when it actually entered the group head which to me was like like magic right but, but my understanding is that <laughs> yeah well it's like after Arthur C. Clarke said that, you know, any science that's sufficiently advanced looks like magic. Or he said something like that. Mm -hmm. But the, um, the, uh, the, the advances in software now, from my understanding, when you're talking about controlling temperatures with, PI, with PIDs, mm -hmm. is, that, um, is that now, even though you're controlling the temperature most times in the boiler, yes. the algorithms are are so good that they now know okay well if he wants to drop two degrees celsius mm -hmm. then this is what we have to do to make that that change happen whereas i think my understanding was i don't know if that's the that's the great advance but my understanding was that that before especially on heat exchanger machines but before on some of these 61 group heads is that you had an issue with uh with 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 temperature stability um not a, not much as temperature stability because oh, sorry getting the right temperature yes well getting the right temperature yes because for example there's a lot of um, machines that tend to overshoot but that depends on the plumbing so for example one of the common things in uh, the nova simonelli the oscar which is mm -hmm. a i mean it's not an e61 group head but it's similar because it's the water circulates in the group head heats it up and then you 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 pour through it. It doesn't look like an E61 group head. It doesn't have all the valves and things, but it's the same thing at the end of the day. That is a smaller group head. It's lighter, 
which means that the water has to flow faster around it. The problem in that case is that the standard setting in the Nuova Simonelli, in the Oscar one and two, the, the water flow was too fast, which means that it was transferring too much heat from the boiler to the group head, which means that the group head gets incredibly hot. And in fact, it has a lot of uh, overshooting temperature, flash boiling out right out of the, of the group head. The, the common solution for that is a flow restrictor. So you just put a okay. flow restrictor, so, a jiggler. So, so, okay, without getting too technical, otherwise, you know, um, yeah. we'll, we'll lose people. No, but, no, absolutely. It's, uh, but, but yeah, I understand. So there's difficulties, right? There's difficulties in, 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 in getting, or there have been, that people have mm -hmm. been trying to overcome in different ways to make the E61 style machines um, work, uh, work, Mm, no, accurately is not the right word. Well, accurately and reliably. But here's my yeah. question, Max. This is what I really want to know. Is it, okay. So the it makes complete sense to me that a saturated group head would just be easier to 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 achieve consistent results because you're not having to do the math of how it gets from point A to point B. You still have to because your your boiler is still going to be at 120 degrees. So you still have to, to determine the, the speed of the flow. But the main difference between the, the saturated group head and the um, uh, E61 is that in the E61, it's a slower response. So everything is slower. So you pull one shot ah. and you have to wait a little bit for the next one to have it at the same temperature. Because it's, it's relying on the thermal mass. The thermal mass in that case, it's not about that. So I've, I've read about, on the, uh, about it on the internet and I don't agree with a lot of the things that I've seen. A, a lot of, uh, one of the main arguments was that the E61 um, undershoots because it's, uh, you have a smaller thermal mass than uh, in a saturated group head. Because in a saturated group head, your thermal mass is your boiler and, and the water in the boiler because it's physically, you're moving the, the, the water into the mm. boiler, which is a more... I mean, water is crappy at transferring heat, but it's easy to move around. Heat is difficult to move around. And brass, for example, is much better at absorbing the heat, but you have to move the water. You can't heat up the brass itself, or you can in theory, but you, have, you need resistance for that. What you have is uh, the limitation in, in this is that you have a constant transfer of heat from the boiler to the group head. And if you have this transfer is too fast, you're going to overheat the group head. Okay. So consider that your, um, your boiler is going to be at 120 degrees, which is not what you want to brew at. You want to brew at 94, 98, depends. Mm -hmm. In an ideal world where there, is, there, there are no losses, you move your water from the boiler to the, to the group head, you don't lose anything, and your group head eventually is going to, to get uh, to 120 degrees. Right? Right. But, but you, you, so, okay, you, you still got some math to do. Yes. But because there's so you a have shorter losses. distance. Oh, no, 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 it's not that. You no. have losses, and you have, you have control on the speed at which you transfer the heat there. Mm -hmm. So the hot water, the amount of hot water that goes around the tubing is determined by the size of the pipes, the size of the tubes. The bigger the tube, the more heat you transfer. That makes sense. The group head. And that's why in the Nova Simonelli, you just put a, a flow restrictor. You put a flow restrictor and the, the group head is colder. Ah, oh, okay. That you just makes have sense. to work that out. So and that is something that you can do with engineering. And that will give you an equation that translates the temperature in the boiler to the temperature in the in the group head and that's always going to be constant between the two because you have constant losses with a saturated group head the your group head reacts much, much faster because the the boiler determines the the, the temperature of the uh, of the group head directly because you physically have the water that becomes your thermal mass all right look look 
we're, we're going to run out of time. So I've got a couple of, because we normally talk for an hour. But I've got a couple yeah. of quick questions leading off of what you just said, because it's quite interesting. So really, the advantage of the saturated group at a speed, like you can change the speed, the, the temperature on it much faster. Yes. Now, I've got a number of questions. I'm going to just shoot them right out at you. Number one, um, does that mean that the, uh, that, so first of all, does it make any, should you care that the temperature can be changed very quickly? Because it depends on the coffees, the number of coffees that you make, and it depends how you set up the, the machine. Well, the number of coffees is this, what's going to be my next question, right? Which was, can, ha, does it make any difference from a consistency point of view? But before that, I, I mean, like, so if I've got a particular coffee I'm drinking and I want to do it at 93 degrees, mm -hmm. um, I set my thing for, I set my E61 group head, I set, sorry, I set my machine for 93 degrees and that's what my E61 is going to put out. I'm not going to suddenly think, oh my God, I've quickly got to do this at 90 two degrees or 91 or 90. I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm making a different coffee, but then I don't know how long it takes to drop down. Maybe I can do a cooling flush and I don't know, mm -hmm. you know, is it, is it that important? It's probably not that important. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering how much of an advantage that is. Next, I'm going to fire them all. Then you've got to answer mm -hmm. them all. Yeah. Next is, is, is some people have been talking about intra-shot thermal stability. That is to say how stable the water is within a single shot. Now, I okay. actually haven't really heard that talked about a lot, but I was just reading up on it and I was sort of wondering whether that's a bit of a non-issue. So I'd like you to answer that too. Mm -hmm. And then finally, this is the big one. This is the money shot right here, right? Which is if that saturated group head is a better design, which it sounds like it is because it's got, you know, it's got something that the E61 doesn't have, right? Which is the ability to, to be faster, faster react. Why doesn't everyone do it? Because it can't be that much more expensive. Is it? Is it down to cost? It's Money. cost. It's probably patents, um, and uh, it's also more complicated to build because ah, you have everything okay. inside the boiler. Everything has to go inside the boiler, and if if you have a leak, if you have a, any sort of problem in the flow in the water flow, you have to open the machine. Ah. But the, the E sixty one. Take the group head off. I can literally do it all apart. Yeah, yeah, that's simple. You can actually take the group head apart. That makes a lot of sense. So, really, you think maybe the manufacturers are coming at a point of view of like, I don't want people to calling me up saying I've got a problem with, I don't know, they're going to have to send an engineer out or you know whatever else. Yeah. The, so the main the main question, the first question is, what's the difference between the two? As um, if you want to drop, they're both relatively fast. They're both accurate. And for what most people use them, if you use them uh, in a home environment, mm. there is no difference whatsoever between the two. Because you know what? You're going, most of the time, 90% of the people are going to set it and forget it. Yeah. So you, you, you decide that you like coffee at 94 degrees and you're going to have it at 94 degrees for most of your, of your uh, life of use. If you change it from one to another, how often do you actually change in between of the day? Does it really matter? And also, you have to heat up a whole thing that is normally better if you leave it on for the whole day or a few hours that you, that you have it up because it's a lot of water to heat up. If you're changing temperature every, every two hours, well, you're probably better off with a gadget and a PID because if temperature accuracy is what, what is important for you, maybe it's not, it's not so important to have a massive machine that can do all of that because it's, it's actually very um, clunky as a method mm. to, to, to do because in a gadget, 20 minutes, less probably, 15 minutes, and you're up to temperature. <laughs> in uh, or uh, Rancilio Silvia, I mean, whichever you prefer, uh, and you can have a PID. So you know that you have the exact accurate temperature that you want. If you want to be more fancy, yes, but there are drawbacks, obviously. So it's really up to you. I don't think anyone would be able to, to, to taste the difference between the two machines. Because once you're at, the, at that temperature, the one coffee that you make is going to be fine. What if about you're if you're the, making shot after shot making shot after, after shot then a, a saturated group head is better okay because you have a better 
better mass and you take care of it straight away in the same way that a Gaggia classic or a Rancidio Silvia with a PID reacts faster to temperature changes. The, your, in, in the Rancidio and the Gaggia, the drawback comes from how fast can you heat up the water. In, in a GS3 in, or in a saturated group head, uh, you you can you will sort you will sense the temperature change in the in the boiler, which which will uh, be addressed rather quickly because you still you already are at a high temperature, so you still have the same issue of the um, I know it heat exchanger yeah heat no 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 in the heat exchanger uh -huh. and the pipe going into and the water heating up into the group head. From my point of view, I think it's more reactive. It's a better uh, it's a better way of doing it in a saturated group. Head. In a saturated group head. But, but can I just ask if you're making shot after shot, but it's the same um, on a let's say it's on a dual boiler with an mm -hmm. E61. So take the heat exchanger out for a second on a dual boiler with E61, and you're making shot after shot of the same coffee. Mm -hmm. Will you see a performance degradation of some kind versus a, a saturated group head? You probably will, but uh, but if it's a machine that is designed for heavy use, it's probably going to have pipes the size of of, of my hand. So mm -hmm. you, it's probably calibrated to to be uh, overcompensating for the for the temperature uh, depletion. So you're basically saying that um, that a design of a group head is not a like a what you call it a, like an immutable is that the right word? And it, there's there's variables in addition to the design. Which yeah. can make it more appropriate for different use cases. Yes. Yeah, got you. Fantastic, Max. We've got one minute to go, and I want to pedal uh, some stuff. First thing, actually, I want to do is actually just um, on the news side. I like to throw these little news items in here. Um, and so, I the SCA did a uh, did a, a sort of webinar. Actually, I think it was an Instagram live thing, which I jumped on. It was really interesting. They had an agronomist from uh, from uh, Brazil. And he was showing the, the damage. Uh, so he's on the ground. He's looking at the damage to Brazil's coffee plants. Uh, he's been there for his whole life. He used to work on a coffee farm. Now he goes and advises farmers over there. And he was saying he's talking to some farmers who've lost 40% of their crop. Uh, some farms have lost everything. Um, but worse, uh, this is the frost. There's the frost in Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm saying this because this is, this is going to, you're not going to notice it right now. You might notice a bit more expensive. But this is for the next year's crop. So what's going to happen is next year's crop is supposed to start soon, but it's not going to happen because so many plants have got damage. Now, some of those coffee trees, um, they don't know the extent of the damage yet because it, it won't be until um, it won't be until later that they can see how whether they're flowering or not flowering or, or whatever else. Um, well, they'll actually see what the extent of the damage is. But uh, he was asked the question whether you know you know whether anything like this has, has happened before and and how long potentially this could be an impact for and he said uh we had a we had a drought back in 2000 i think it was in 2014 and he said they never recovered from it so they've literally um i think the brazilian government is looking at a massive bailout i mean hundreds of millions of dollars to go to coffee farmers trying to work out through satellite photography which farms have been badly damaged um to compensate farmers but the thing is how long does it take to grow a coffee tree max do you know a few years three years to for the to they start to flower so even if those farmers got money in their pockets today and replanted and this didn't happen again in the next three years uh, it would be three more years before they got up back up to production and the yep. question is whether the brazilian government is going to fund them for three years or more um, so you could see not just uh, damaged, um, not just uh, a, a, a massive drop in the av availability of Brazilian beans, but you could see um, you could see actually those farmers just leaving, exiting the the, the business entirely because they they got to earn a living. Um, but anyway, so there's that side of it just to make people aware that uh, that uh, Brazilian coffee beans are going to be very difficult to get a hold of. I was talking to a friend of mine um, who uh, works in Colombia on coffee farms and she's saying Colombia's also got problems she said they don't talk 
as much about the issues. Um, it's very difficult to get sort of the truth out of farmers. Um, they haven't been hit as bad as Brazil, but they have not had, I think, a great harvest. Um, they're not necessarily very optimistic. So what this means is it means coffee prices are going to go up and, uh, and some of your favorite blends are not going to be available. So drink them now. That's what I'm going to say about that. Mm -hmm. uh, then... And obviously, container prices also are ridiculous. Shipping at the moment, I think, in some cases, has gone up by 400%. So to ship a container, across it's 400%. Yeah. And the one exception, by the way, I think, is going to be India. Because India imports a massive amounts of cashew nuts. And so they've got a bunch of containers left there empty that they want to bring back. So mm -hmm. India's had a good harvest. So probably you're going to be looking at a lot of Indian coffees coming on the market. That's our news update. Um, and there is also uh, Hawaii uh, just issued a, a, a major, a major uh, warning because there was rust. Coffee leaf rust is on every major island bad, now. Real bad. Every major island of Hawaii. Coffee leaf rust is the most um, dangerous of the diseases for coffee plants. It is super, uh, super, um, what's the word, spreadable? <laughs> so what? Yeah, it's it's a fungus. Contagious. It's a fungus. Yeah, uh, rust is uh, is is really really bad. It's it, and it's difficult to contain. It's difficult to treat. And, Very difficult um, to treat. It's easier to prevent it than to actually treat it as a cura as a curative. That's right. There's a few things. It's interesting. The Hawaiian government has has um, authorized uh, pesticides mm -hmm. uh, that are not appropriate for coffee plants to be used on coffee plants coming out of Hawaii because they're desperate. Um, yeah. There's some interesting research. As a scientist, you'd be very interested in this, Max. I cannot talk about these things. Okay. But there's some interesting research going on uh, into a particular pathogen, which is a, um, there's a particular bug. I, can't remember what it was. I think it may be in a fungus itself, uh, which eats coffee leaf rust fungus. And they are looking into whether or not they can introduce this other Thing, which is a natural predator to the fungus to try to to destroy the the coffee leaf rust fungus so uh yeah there's lots of i mean you know if you're into this kind of stuff even if you're not um it is interesting if you have a particular like you say oh, i really like that blend of you know blah 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 you know it you may take not be able to get it <laughs> take care of it and enjoy it because you may not get it next year okay on to fun things this is still the unopened box of the peak water filter which we are giving away and uh, you can win this, no, uh, no um, purchase necessary. Uh, you can win this if you're in the UK, if you're in the mainland UK, I'm gonna send this to some lucky winner. Uh, all you need to do is to go down to the show notes below and there'll be a link to a place where you can register. Uh, all you need to do is put your email in there and uh, we will notify a winner every month of what they've won. We're normally giving away coffee beans. This month, we're giving away the peak water filter. And if you have not uh, used or heard of them and you are using regular water in your coffee machine, this will be a game changer. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. That's my new thing. Game changer uh, for you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah, setting up the right kind of water for coffee is completely different. Uh, by the way, they're not a sponsor of this show, they, they, and I bought this with my own money. Um, so it's just something I personally use, uh, and I do recommend it made a complete difference to me. So that's something we'll be giving away. Uh, good luck to you all, and we will see you next week. Bye. <laughs>